We prayed. Amen. You may be seated. Um, so we have a fig tree now um, in our backyard, and this is kind of like our first year harvesting the figs. And I've learned a lot about figs. Um, I learned that figs is good for you. Um, they have a lot of good vitamins, have a, a lot of antioxidant. And I also learned that that's a really good timing. Uh, that's a, have to be a perfect timing for you to harvest figs. If you harvest figs too early, it will not continue to ripe. The same thing if you harvest too late, it will be over ripened, it will be very uh, soft and very, um, you know, a little bit soggy and uh, very, be, be very mushy as well. And not all figs will turn out to be good figs. Um, some would not ripe properly, some would would fall off before they even um, uh, ripe properly, and some would be eaten by the critters. And just looking at all this fruit that fall off the tree and around the tree, I saw wasted fruits. I saw weighted, wasted um, figs. And I was thinking, even though the tree was very low maintenance, and if you have a fig tree, you know that, right? You don't have to put a lot of effort in to take care of it. All you have to do is really watering it and even, even that, there's a lot of things that went in for a tree to bear fruit. And if you're thinking about it, there are a lot, a lot of expectations from the, the, the fruit that you're expecting to come out of this tree. You're expecting the figs to be very good food, um, but not all of them turn out to be good. And when I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking of wasted potential. Wasted potential, so that's the title for my message this evening, Wasted Potential. So um, if you look at Jeremiah 24, 1, the Bible is telling us that God's showing Jeremiah two baskets of figs. Let's look at verse 1 again. Say, the Lord show me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the prince of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So this story is taking place after um, the, the people in Judah getting uh, you know, in captivity and brought into uh, Babel and Babylon. And the Bible explained that this event occurred after Nebuchadnezzar carried away the captives from Judah into Babylon. And by way of background, let's, let's take a step back and look at the story. Like, what caused this captivity? What caused the captivity of the people of Judah? So first, we see the spiritual decline. The spiritual decline. God has warned the children of Israel for their spiritual decline. Back in the days of Moses, all the way back from Deut Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15, it says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto my voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. In verse 36, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. So God had warned these people that if they don't give, that if they don't keep his commandments, God will, you know, turn them over to other country, turn them over to the enemies. And God gave them so many chances, even though they keep on sinning, keep on turning their back on God, they keep on worshiping other idols, and God is still giving them chances after chance. And what does this really show? Well, it shows that men are wicked. Men are wicked. That wicked sin, the sin of idolatry, the sin of their flesh, and all led by their kings, right? Um, wicked kings. And we've heard rise and falls on leadership and people follow what the leaders do. And in the 21 kings that reigned in Judah, only six of them were good kings. Only six of them did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And the other 15 kings, they either fell into wicked sin or they let, other pe let the people to worship idols. So first we saw the, that men are wicked. Second, we saw that God's grace and mercy amidst of all situations. So the story of 
all the story about these kings of Judah not only highlight the wickedness of men, but also demonstrate about God's grace and his mercy. Well, God didn't have to wait until after 21 kings reigning over Judah to, to uh, give them up and, and, and allow um, them to be, be in captive. You know, God could have done it when um, Rehoboam um, sinned and split the kingdom in half. So God is still showing the same mercy and grace to every one of us, whether those who are not saved, whether those who are backslidden Christians, whether those who are sinning Christians, and even to America, God is still showing his grace and mercy. And we saw this spiritual decline, which led to the captivity. So they took away King Jeconiah and the prince of Judah, the carpenters and the smith. And even in Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible described that they also took away a certain group of people. Here's the description in chapter Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. It says, children in whom was no blemish, but well favor, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So they took away the king's seeds. They took away the children with no blemish. They took away the best of the best, those who are skillful, um, those who have knowledge and wisdom and uh, understanding in science. They took away the carpenters. They took about away the smiths. And the rest get left behind there in Judah. So after all these events took place, we get to where we are here in Jeremiah chapter 24. And it said again in Jeremiah 24, the Lord show me and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. So God showing Jeremiah two baskets of figs. One basket contained good figs and the other basket, bad figs. Now just imagine being in Jeremiah's shoes. After witnessing all these things happening to, to the nation of Judah, seeing um, Judah got defeated and uh, the kingdom's fallen and the, the, king, um, the king got taken away captive and the prince got taken away. And now God is showing Jeremiah two baskets of figs. I would be very confused as why? Why, Lord, why would you show me two baskets of figs after all these happened? Well, the question I had when I first read this chapter is, why did God use figs, right? He could have used other fruits, orange, apple, maybe mango, lychee. Um, why figs, right? Uh, personally, I, I don't think I like figs as much as maybe mango. But, you know, this is the this, uh, significance of figs in the Bible. And if you actually look it up, the word fig or figs occurs 66 times in the Bible. And the fig tree, the word fig tree occurs 72 times. And it, um, it was first occur in Genesis 3-7. In Genesis 3-7, the story of Adam and Eve, right? Genesis 3-7, it said, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So Adam and Eve here, they've sinned. We've heard a story before. They've sinned. They, they, uh, they've eaten the forbidden fruit, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed together um, something to cover that nakedness by using fig leaves. We also notice figs being mentioned um, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 to 8. It says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into the, a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and, and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and, and uh, oil of olive and honey. So before the children of Israel enter the promised land that God has promised them, God gave them a description of how the land would look like. And, a fig, tr and fig trees were part of that description of the fruits that would be in the promised land. Another occurrence of the, the, the word fig or fig tree is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 to 19. It say, now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. This is talking about Jesus. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, 
but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee, henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So this is one of the well-known um, story maybe we read in the, in the New Testament story illustrate how powerful Jesus is, right? We, he, he found an unfruitful fig tree. He just got rid of the tree just by his word, All right? So we, we saw that um, the fig tree, the word figs occur multiple times in the Bible, but in the Bible, figs is also used as a meter, a meter for spiritual health, meter for spiritual health. First, we see the symbol of blessing and promise from God by using figs. First King 4.25, it said, And Judah and Israel dwell safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So during the days of Solomon, King Solomon, um, God promised the, the nation of Israel that they'll have peace. they have peace and they have to go to war. And now it will say here that, um, it described here in this verse that they were dwell safely, every man under his vine and fig tree. So we saw that when the nations of Israel are doing well spiritually, God is using that as a picture that the fig tree is doing well as well. And the second, we also see it as a symbol of spiritual decline, spiritual decline. Joel one twelve it said, the vine is dried up and the fig tree languished. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the son of men. During the time of judgment, after, after the people have sinned, the Bible describes the condition of Judah after a long period of drought. The fig tree was described as languish, or it also means as falling or failing to make progress. So God used figs as a meter for the spiritual health and illustrate the spiritual condition in the Bible. So in the same fashion, God is using these two baskets of figs we just read about to um, illustrate to us and to, to prophesy to us those who are in captivity and those remain in, 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 in uh, Jerusalem, what will happen to them. So let's take a closer look and analyze these two baskets of figs. So we get on to verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3 we see the description here. Description of the basket of good figs. So verse two, it said, one basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. Verse three, it said, then said the Lord unto me, what seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, very, the good figs, very good. So we saw two description here. The first description is that very good figs. And the second description that even like the figs, that are first ripe. So here, I have a bowl of figs. So if you can really see, I have a picture there, but if you look at the figs here, um, you can tell, like, it's pretty good conditions. Um, really good color, it's green and purple, uh, it's not too soft and perfectly, uh, perfectly ripe. And I imagine that is what Jeremiah saw in the temple of the Lord. It's a basket of figs just sitting there, good figs. However, these figs right here are not first ripe figs. First ripe figs, um, I was really surprised when I first saw it um, a few months ago. They, they were about the size of my fist. It was huge, it was like two, about two or three times bigger than this. And when we think about first ripe fruits, we want to think about giving to God. We want to give to God our best. And, you know, when we give to God, you know, give God our best, whether it's our finance, whether it's our service for God, whether it's our talent or even our life. You know, give God our best. Don't give God a leftover. Give God the good, fru uh, good food and the, the first bright food in our life. So we saw a basket of good figs, so something similar like this. And let's take a look and see what does this basket of good figs represent. So verse four and five, it say, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent unto, sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. 
So the basket of good figs is a picture of those that were carried away in captivity of Judah. Now, when I, when I think of those that were carried away in captivity, I thought of the prominent Bible characters um, that were in, capti- in, in captivity in Babylon. I'm thinking of um, the book of Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 1, verse 6. It's described, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Right? These are the, the people that I first think of when I'm thinking of, thinking of those who were in captivity. And, and as we move on, these were the character that remained faithful to God, even though they went through different trials and different persecutions. And so we saw this represent, rep, representation of this basket of good figs are those who in captivity, um, that were in captivity. So now we move on and see um, verse 6 and 7. We see the promises, the promises from God. They say, for I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them in heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So there were two promises that we found here in these two verse. Promise number one, God said, God will set his eyes on those in captivity for good. Verse 6, it says, for I will set my eyes upon them for good. Now, think of those characters I just mentioned earlier. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, right? All these characters were able to claim these promises that we just look at. And especially this promise, number one, God will set his eyes on those in captivity. First, we think about Daniel, right? We, we learn about the story of Daniel. He prayed three times a day, and even the government mandate and tell, tell him that he could not pray, he still went on and prayed. And as a result, he got punished for that. He got thrown into the lion's den. But he survived um, that punishment. So as a result, he was able to claim the promises from God. God set his eyes on Daniel, and Daniel has a heart that would know God. He has a heart that would love God fully. How about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Right? They wouldn't eat of the king's meat. They would not defile their body. They would not bow down before the king. And as a result, they were punished for that. They were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, but they did not get burned. So they were able to claim the promise of God as well. God set his eyes on Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They have a heart that they want, that would know God, a heart that they love God, and they would rather die than defile themselves and bow down before the king. So that's promise number one. Promise number one is that God will set his eyes on those in captivity. Pro- promise number two here is that those in captivity will return to Jerusalem again. So if you look at verse 6 and 7 again, it said, And I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. God will build them up. God will plant them when they return Um, to Judah, to Jerusalem again. So that is the promise of God. And we saw this promise being fulfilled if you think about Zerubbabel, you think about Ezra, Haggai, and you know, from Ezra 2.1, we saw Zerubbabel able to lead the Jews to return to Jerusalem. It says in Ezra 2.1, now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which have been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone into his city. So everyone's able to return to that city after the captivity, as God has promised. Not only that they return, but they also had the desire to serve God, to, to please God. If you look at Haggai 1.14, they have a desire to build the temple of God again. So we saw this, this promise being fulfilled. These people returned to God. 
with their whole heart, and they had desire to build the temple for God. So now we saw, we just saw the basket of good figs. Let's take a closer look at the basket of bad figs. Let's go back to verse 2 and 3 again. Verse 2 and 3. It said right here in verse 2, the description of the bad, um, bad figs. It said, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. And the verse 3 is described as, as, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. So this description is this. They have very naughty figs. They could not be eaten. They were so bad. Evil, very evil, and they cannot be eaten. They are so evil. So this is a really bad description of the, 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 the food. So I have here another basket, um, another bowl of figs. If you look at it, some of them look really bad. Like this one right here did not, you know, really grow fully and got, you know, fell off the tree and start shrinking up. And some was eaten by maybe um, a bird or something, so it then fell off. And this really bad shape, right? I would not eat it. Um, if I get to choose between these two bowls, I would choose the figs in this bowl. So that, I imagine, that's what Jeremiah saw. Set, beside, uh, set in front of the temple of the Lord, one basket as good figs and one as bad figs. And let's see what it represents. Let's see what this basket of bad figs represents. All right, in verse 8, we look at verse 8. It says, And as of evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his prince, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. So a basket of bad figs represent King Zedekiah, represent the residue of Jerusalem and those who left to, to Egypt. So what's so special about this group of people? What did they do? Well, the Bible described them in 2 Chronicles 36, 11 to 14. It says Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when, um, when he began to reign, and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chiefs of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abomination of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So these, this group of people, they rejected God. You know, they, they hear God's word, but they choose not to listen to it. They know what is right, but they went on and sinned. And they, they, they rather choose to worship idols than to worship God. And God also has some promises for these people as well. Look at verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10 is saying, And I would deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, for their hurt to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. So that's a really strong promise there that God gave to this group of people. God said they're going to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. God is going to send sword, famine, pestilence, just to consume them off from the land. And also God said that they're going to be a reproach and a proverb. That is that's saying, I'm going to make you a bad example not to follow. And, you know, that's a very embarrassing thing to do um, for all these people. And look at, look how this promise was fulfilled in Jeremiah 44, verse 11 to 14. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall be consumed. 
and all in the land of Egypt, they shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even to the greatest by the sword and by the famine, and they shall be in execrations and astonishment and a curse and a reproach, for I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by, by the sword, by the famine, and the pestilence. So that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt so, to sojourn there, shall escape or remain, that they sh should return into the land of Judah, to the which they have desired to return to dwell there, for none shall return but such as shall escape. Now God sent enemy to defeat them. God sent a pestilence, um, locusts, to eat up their, um, the food that they have on the land. God sent famine. You know, they have drought. And all the fruit, all the fruit tree wither away like we just read earlier. And God fulfilled his promise, just like he have said in the verses we just read. So after ob observing this two basket of figs, let's take a look at the applications. What, let's see what we can learn from this two basket of figs. First, we can learn that we can trust in God's word. We can trust in God's word. You know, all these promises that we just read regarding the, the basket of good figs and the basket of bad figs, all those promises, God made it happen. God kept all those promises. And there are so many promises that we can claim in the Bible. And if God made a promise, he will be able to fulfill it. And the only thing that we need to do is that we have to find out those pro what those promises are and be able to claim it for our life. So first, we, we learn that we can trust in God's word because he will keep, keep his word. Second, we need to learn to trust in God no matter what circumstances we're in. Just like this basket of good figs and those that were in captivity, they were in pretty bad shape. They would get carried away to a different country and you would expect them to be the one who, who, who stopped their faith, who, who would turn from God and, and start worshiping um, whatever ever idols they have there in, in Babylon. But they did not. They remained steadfast in the faith. They continued to trust in God, uh, even though they are in a very difficult situation. You know, as Christians, we'll face difficult, difficult times. Right? We will have trial in our life. We will have affliction in our life. We, we will face perse persecutions for our faith. It is those times that we need to stand firm for our faith and trust in God that he will help us and trust in God wholeheartedly in those times. And the third thing we can learn is that don't fall into the trap of complacency. Don't fall into the trap of complacency. You know, the basket of bad figs um, represent those who um, left behind in Jerusalem after the captivity. They probably got, they didn't have to leave their home country. They got comfortable where they were at. But instead of coming together and, you know, gather together and repent toward God and ask God to forgive them, they continued to sin because they got comfortable where they at. They turned their back on God and worship idols. You know, God may give us a good life here in America. God may bless us with a lot of things in our life. And just like Revelation um, 3.17 say, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, a lot of time we get into a place of complacency. And if we're not careful, we might start worshiping those things that God has given us in our life. You know, God may have blessed us with much things in our life, but Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, it says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. God gave us all his resources so that we can even further the gospel, not for us to just sit back and relax and get comfortable and, and just let other people serve and, and other missionary in different country to, to share the gospel. You know, God wants us to be able to advance the gospel even further because of the things he has blessed us with. And as we learn about these two baskets of figs, we might, we might think in our head, we might wonder, why does it seem like God showed more mercy and grace to those in captivity than those that were left behind Jerusalem? 
You know, God actually showed a lot of mercy and grace to all the Jews in Jerusalem before the captivity, right? He, he sent one prophet after another, just um, preaching to them, asked them to repent, asked them to, you know, turn back to God, but none of them listened. But even after the captivity, those who were taken away and those who got left behind, they have something in common still. And that one thing in common is that they still have access to God. They can still come to God, respond to Him, and repent of their sin. But they choose not to do that. And I truly believe if the remnants and the king Zedekiah repented of their sin and turned away from their false idols and worshiped God wholeheartedly, you know, God would have spared them from being consumed from the land. And if we take a step back and just look at the whole picture, we really see a wasted potential, a wasted potential. You know, just like the basket of bad figs here, if you really look at each and every of these figs, they all have the potential to be good figs. But they did not uh, for various reasons. And it's a wasted potential. And you know, just the same way, all the Jews that were consumed from the land had the potential to be the ones that have a heart that truly know God and truly love God like those who have returned from captivity. You know, God is extending the same love, the same grace, and the same opportunity for all of us here. You know, and He is giving us a free will to respond to Him in the following area. First, in the area of our salvations. Our salvations. You know, God wants us all to be safe. Now, throughout the scripture, God is warning us that there's an afterlife. God's warning us there, there's, um, because of our sin, if we don't repent and ask Jesus to save us, he would punish us and we will spend eternity in hell. You know, but God extending his love right now. He's extending his love through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sin. And if we ask Jesus to save us from our sin, we can spend eternity in heaven. But there are, some of the, there are some of us who have never accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. If you fall into that category, I want to remind you of the parable of a fig tree that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. Turn your Bible there real quick, Matthew 24, verse 32 to 41. Matthew 24, verse 32 to 21. It said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When this branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angel of heaven, but my Father only, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. So the, the story here, Jesus is telling us about a fig tree. Now the fig tree I have at, at home, um, when it's about to uh, become a, a summer season, you'll see the branch getting a little bit tender. You'll see um, the, the, the leaves start growing out, and you see some of the fruits start growing. And that's when you know it's the summertime. The same thing here, Jesus is telling us that all these things shall pass away, um, all, all these things that he's mentioned shall pass as a sign of his coming again. God, Jesus is telling us that he will come back again, but that no man know it when. God says only God the Father would know when he would come back and rapture out the people. And, and Jesus gave an example here of Noah. Noah's here was just begging the people but hey, there's a flood coming. Come into the ark to be saved so that you would not die. But no one listened to him, and they all perished. No, that's the same, same thing about salvations. 
No, Jesus is begging us right now. Be saved today. Be saved today so that you don't have to spend eternity in hell. And, you know, Jesus might come back and rapture us out even tonight, maybe tomorrow. But when that time comes, this, will, this is what will happen. Look at verse 40 with me again. It says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. One shall be taken, and the other left. You know, the rapture can happen anytime. And when that rapture happens, will you be the one be taken, or will you be the one left behind? You know, friends, if you're not saved, you know, get saved today. You know, rapture can happen anytime. Don't be the one that left behind. And, you know, get saved so that you, that you can join that group that be taken with Jesus when the rapture happens. You know, don't delay, don't push it to, to tomorrow. You know, we are not promised another day on earth. So don't waste God's love for you. Another area that God allows us to freely respond to him is the area of our service. The area of our service. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, good work is not a requirement for salvation, and praise the Lord for that. We, there's not enough good works we can do to earn our way to heaven. But after we are saved, after we become a Christian, good work is a requirement, a supposed requisite for us uh, as a Christian. It is expected of us to serve God. It is expected of us to, to spread the gospel, go soul winning, and tell as many people as we can about Jesus. It is expected of us to have a daily walk with him, to read our Bible and to pray every day. It is expected of us to give give to missions, give to building, give our tithe, right? It's expected of us to be kind one to another and to love one another. It's expected of us to be fruitful Christians. And Jesus reminds us in Matthew 5, 13, they say, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then for good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. No, Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth. And one of the main purposes of salt is to really bring flavor to your food, right? I like to add salt to my food so that it tastes a little bit better. But can you imagine salt that has lost its flavor? Would you add flavorless salt to your food? I would not, absolutely not, right? That's kind of, that's kind of defeat the purpose. And, you know, Jesus said that when salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. It doesn't have a purpose anymore. It's to be cast out. As Christians, we all have a purpose. In Ephesians 2.10, 2, we, we read earlier, our purpose is that we, uh, we are created in his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Our good works should bring glory to God. And if we're not fulfilling this purpose of our Christian life, we will be wasting our life. We will be wasted potential in the eyes of God. I started coming out to church um, when I was in ninth grade um, through the ministry of youth fellowship. And I remember I was, um, I went to an ice skating event that they have and, and several months went by after I first came out to that evangelistic event, I got saved. And as a new, new Christian, I remember looking up to a lot of the upperclassmen, looking up to those who got saved, you know, maybe a little bit longer than I have, and, and just be able to watch these mature Christians and learn from them. I remember going to family camp with them, going to youth camp with them, and, and just really uh, spending time in prayer with them, and really talk, talk about decisions that we make from preaching services. And, really be able to um, think of different ways we can serve God better. And, and I remember just really watching all these youth, all these peers that I'm hanging out with and really think about the potential they all have for God. I think I was thinking that, wow, one day this person is going to be a missionary. 
Probably one day this person going to be, um, be, be a preacher, probably be a pastor's wife, and just be a pastor some, um, somewhere. And, you know, all these potential I saw in these people. But as time go- goes on, I slowly start to watch some of these upperclassmen or some of these mature Christians start dropping out of church because they got distracted by the things of this world. And all this potential that I saw were wasted. Really broke my heart to think and where they would be today if they stay faithful to the Lord. You know, God, God could use them to be a pastor. God could use them to be a missionary. You know, God could use them to reach even more people for Christ. But they got distracted by the things of this world. Friends, are, are you wasting the potential God has for your life? Are we living in the will of God? You know, are you living a Christian life to the full potential that God has intended for you to live? You know, let's be fruitful Christian and not waste the potential he has for you. And if, are you saved this evening? If you're not saved, you know, be, sh- be sure to talk to one of us so that we can explain to you what it means to be saved so that you can know for sure that you can go to heaven. With that, let's close our eyes. Let's bow our head pray. Before we pray, I want to ask a question. Brother Kwong, I know 